Good morning. My name is Jim Skinner, and I'm sort of the person who's trying to keep these other people in line. Um, we are here today to talk about a, a very special person. He, uh, we, we were going to celebrate some life, uh, some of his life, and we, we have stories. There's so many stories that we we probably need another another day, but we're going to start with some of them anyway. And I would like Jack. Jack would be embarrassed if we if he knew we were doing this, but that's who Jack was. Jack had said he did not want to name lecture after himself, but he want, he preferred to help young people, and I will explain a little bit later how we're doing that. But I know he would be embarrassed because of all the people that are here and, and what's, what's going to be do, happening over this next hour. Before we start, I'd like to have the family stand up and turn around, because many of you know Jack, but don't necessarily know all the family. So if Dottie, if you would stand up, for, and Dottie is his wife, and then Christy and Wendy, and his brother and his wife. <clears throat> Dottie, isn't it wonderful the number of people who are here? The, the, I found out that the Wilmore family invested in stocks for Kleenex tissue. <laughs> they might have figured they would get, try to get some return on their investment while they're here in San Diego. So we are going to start out by not make, making a few announcements. And let me see if I can get the, the next slide here. We have, as I mentioned to you, we have Dottie, Wendy and Christy are here. Melissa will be here tomorrow. Tomorrow, they're going to go to the Christian Fellowship breakfast, uh, meeting. And many of you may or may not know, but Mike Pollack and, and uh, Jack Wilmore started this a number of years ago. And then they're, they, they're going to go to the past president's luncheon and see a lot of the, uh, the old timers that were, who've known Jack for many years. Then there's a reception tomorrow afternoon at 4.30 at the Sapphire Terrace at the, the hotel. So if any of you didn't get a chance to talk to them today and you want to come by and say hello to them and talk to them, they will be there at that particular time. <clears throat> I mentioned that Jack much preferred that we do something for the young people and not just so we started up uh, in January middle January we started up a mem memorial fund and uh, we have the two people that I'm going to introduce and have them come up and say just a few words and the first one is uh, Jim Peterson from Healthy Learning and he's going to talk about the, the, his contribution to this fund Jim <clears throat> A couple of years ago, we were fortunate enough to have uh, Jack and Dottie come to Monterey and do some uh, film lectures slash presentations, and we thought it would be appropriate to uh, give everyone in here who is interested in receiving a free digital download of Jack's presentation on the Heritage Family Study. Uh, all it will take for you to get that it, on the way out on the two tables that are inside, either leave your business card or write your uh, email address down so that we can send that to you and we'll get that to you in the next 10 days or so. He did, you know, not unexpectedly, he did a terrific job on this particular DVD, plus you'll get a chance to capture uh, kind of the essence of Jack with regard to the Heritage Family Study. Unlike many people in here, I have my own personal memories of Jack Wilmark because I was a student in finance at UC Berserkly back in the days of rage. And in my particular job working in, I had a job working in the, in the uh, gym. And in those days, UC Berkeley had a pretty robust doctoral program in exercise science and variations of that. So I got asked to be a participant in a lot of those studies. And I can't honestly tell you the first time I did one of, I was a participant in one of those studies because I was in literally dozens of them. But I sure in hell can tell you the last one I did. And that was Jack Wilmore's because he beat the living bejesus out of me. And I'm 
taught at West Point for 20 years. I've worked with Rangers. I've, I've, I've seen SEAL training. I've, I've developed generals. And I have never been so challenged by another human being in my life. But it's my honor looking back on the fact that uh, to be a participant in his uh, doc doctoral dissertation study. Anyway, on behalf of the ACSM Store and Healthy Learning, we're, we're, we're honored to give you a free digital download of this particular DVD. Thank you very much. When we decided in uh, mid-January to set up this fund, one of the first people I called was Reiner Martins, who was the founder of Human Kinetics. And he said, call me back in a few days. And I called him, and we talked a little bit more. And he says, within one week, I had an answer. And he, they are giving uh, $1,000 over a year for 10 years to get this thing started. So Skip Meyer, who is the uh, incoming CEO of Human Kinetics, would like to say a few words on behalf of that, organi that company. <coughs> Well, thank you, uh, Jim and ACSM, for inviting me here to, to say a few words today. Um, first and foremost, I want to pass on uh, my regrets on behalf of Reiner Martins and his wife, Julie, that they weren't able to be here today. Um, Reiner considered Jack a very dear friend, colleague, and, and collaborator over the past 30 years. Reiner noted to me in his, that in his view, Jack made very few mistakes uh, over his illustrious career. Uh, but one of those was electing to not publish the physiology of sport and exercise with human kinetics. Uh, in Reiner's words, he did eventually uh, see the air in his ways um, and brought uh, this wonderful text to human kinetics in 1994. Um, and the rest, as they say, is history. Um, David Costell came on board as co-author at that time. Uh, Larry Kenny joined for the fourth edition. Um, and it has become, over the past decade, the number one uh, text in the field. Just this month, HK published the sixth edition of Physiology of Sport and Exercise. And uh, we have no doubt that it will continue to set the standard um, for textbooks in this field. As Jim mentioned, um, and it is with great pleasure that I'd like to, to announce Hugh and Kinetic's funding uh, of an ACSM endowment in Jack's honor. We will be providing $1,000 annually, as Jim said, over the next 10 years, um, primarily to fund scholarships to help young researchers attend this ACSM annual meeting. Uh, so again, thank you for providing us um, with this opportunity to honor Jack and his legacy in this way. Thank you. Can we get the next? So I'm, I'm pleased to announce that as of last Friday, we have raised a little bit over $27,000. On the, on for this, uh, this endowment fund. Our goal is to get to 40. And I'm, I'm going to mention to you, uh, those of you who are, uh, have, would like to contribute, it's very, we make it very simple for you to give money. You go to the website, you go to the foundation, and under endowments and, and, uh, and funds, you, there's a button that says click now, and it, tell, it tells you the, all the information. You pick which fund you want to give the money to and your, uh, your credit card, and that's it. And so we hoped to raise 40000 as I said. What we're going to do <clears throat> is, is to do this for basic or applied young investigators. And the way we set it up initially, because we weren't sure how much money we were going to get, it was going to be $500 for each person each year for whatever number of years that we had money. And it was going to be either two years past the doctorate degree or two years past the training in an, in for an MD. And people are interested in basic or applied science. And because Jack did both, what we've done <coughs> 
we're going to alternate, and one year we'll do basic, one year we'll do applied. And we, Jackie wrote a lot of papers, and he has about 319 that were not chapters or reviews and that sort of thing. And so Larry Kenny has a, uh, a graduate student going through, and we're separating out what is basic, what's applied, and what's both. And we're going to get that list together, and whenever someone applies, they have to take two of those articles and say how what Jack did influenced what they did, what their, their, their own research is. The, we, the idea is we know now that many people know who Jack is, but 20 years from now, someone's going to say, I've heard the name, but I have no idea. This way, they are they will look through about 180 publications on the basic side or, or on the applied side and say, I, I, I'll pick two and I'll read them and I'll get some idea what he did. And I think this is a better way of, of people to remember him than just say, I can get some money and I'll just throw something in and try to get it. And so the, the plan would be, if we can get up to $40,000, we should be able to do pay $1,000 a, a year to two people for about 25 years. And I think that's long enough. So I, we, 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 any help you can give toward that, we would really appreciate it. OK, what I'm going to do now is to explain the program, and then we're going to get right to it. <clears throat> every, every speaker has, has time, but we have decided that they don't have to use it. What we would like to do at the end is have people come up and say a word or two about Jack that they know. Now, we don't want you to get up and say, I know Jack was a great guy. We all know that. But listen to what other, other people are saying. And if you've got some unique story that thinks gets the essence of Jack, we would love to hear it. You have about one minute. And remember, this is not part of your curriculum vita that you can say, I gave a lecture at the ACSM Congress. <laughs> OK? So I'm going to keep, keep the time down, because we'd like to get as many people as possible. <clears throat> so the, the, we're going to start talking about Jack as a teacher, as a co-worker, as a basic scientist, as an applied scientist, as a friend, and then uh, Wendy, his daughter Wendy, is going to say something on behalf of the family, and then we're going to get comments from the audience. So here we go, learning a little bit about Jack Wilmore. And the first speaker is uh, Mike Joyner, talking about Jack as a teacher. I want to start by telling you Jack was a great guy. But in fact, he was a great teacher. And I was lucky enough to meet him when I was 19 years old. But I think as I've reflected further on Jack as a teacher, uh, the Japanese word sensei, or master, comes to mind. And really, the cartoon version of that is somebody like Obi-Wan Kenobi or Yoda. And to be a master and a master teacher like Jack was, you have to have a certain mastery of knowledge. Uh, you have to master the, the fundamental skill of hard work and self-discipline, which Jack had in spades. Uh, Jack was also a master lecturer. Every time I hear that researchers can't teach undergraduates, I laugh because Jack was simply the best lecturer and best uh, uh, course teacher I ever, ever had in, in, in that context, as well as a teacher in the lab. And Jack had also mastered himself. And I can't imagine uh, the sorts of, of struggles and resentments and things that he had as a faculty member, because that we all have. But you really never heard him say a bad thing about anybody else. So if you go sort of down the checklist of mastery, Jack had mastered a lot of things. But that only scratches the surface, because what Jack had truly mastered as a teacher was an ability to meet students and other people where they were versus where he was. And I think that was quite important. It made him very, very effective. Um, I think he mastered the ability to channel and challenge other people in a constructive way. And I think what Jack mastered most of all was this uh, kind of continuous, infectious optimism. So an experiment wouldn't go well. A paper would get rejected. Uh, you'd have some sort of setback in life. And there was Jack uh, finding uh, the silver lining and, and uh, telling you things like, uh, well, you know, this could be an opportunity. And always focusing on the upside of things. And the thing I always think about as 
I work with younger people, or really work with anything, was a printout, of something he had printed above his desk that said, don't let the urgent crowd out the important. And as I reflect on how busy he must have been, what really impresses me is that he had time uh, for young people, time for students, time for people that were so ignorant they didn't know how ignorant they were. And he had time to patiently channel their energy and channel their efforts so that they could uh, reach their goals and really develop goals that they didn't even know existed when they first met him. So that's what I would say about Jack. And if I take anything away from all the many things that I learned with him over the last uh, 40 years, it was don't let the urgent uh, crowd out the important. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mike. And Phil Stanforth is going to talk about Jack as a coworker. Phil? First, if I could have everybody who was one of Jack's students um, please stand. Then if I could have everyone who um, served on the faculty with Jack, please stand. <clears throat> and if we could ask all of you um, <clears throat> at the completion of this, if you'd all come to the front, uh, we would like to get a picture with Jack in the background. What an honor and privilege it is to share about working with Jack Wilmore. This is like <clears throat> the guy who held the paints telling what it was like to work with Michelangelo. In 1976, I graduated from a small school in South Dakota. I headed to the graduate school at the University of Arizona I knew nothing about graduate school, and I knew nothing about exercise physiology, and I'd never heard of Jack Wilmore before. By God's providence, Dr. Wilmore came as department head at that same time. <clears throat> During my first year of graduate school, he gave me the opportunity to be part of a, a group that was planning the U of A adult fitness program, and then he hired me to work in it. When he got ready to go to Texas, he gave me the opportunity to go along. At Texas, when the heritage study came along, he gave me the opportunity to work in that. And then when he went to, to A&M, he gave me the opportunity to still work for him um, from Austin. So for 25 years, Jack was my boss. But as Mike puts it so well, nobody worked for Jack. You worked with him. And it wasn't just me. Um, Jack was my wife, Dixie's um, primary professor. And she served on the faculty with him for his whole time at the University of, of Texas. And it wasn't just Jack. Dottie and Jack were in our wedding. And we were at the Wilmore household many times for, for dinners that, that, that Dottie hosted. Um, Christy came to Texas and got her master's degree with Jack. And she was my counterpart um, at Arizona State in the heritage program. And Melissa would work in the, the summers in the lab. So the whole Wilmore family um, is very important to the Stand Force, and we have been greatly blessed by them, and we are exceedingly grateful. <clears throat> Many of you knew Jack from conferences or presentations, but you may wonder, you know, what was he really like on a day-to-day -day basis? Well, let me tell you, the person that you all knew at conferences 
was the same person that I knew day to day in the good times um, and in the rough times. Jack treated every person with honor and dignity like they were the most important person in the world. When he was being recruited to Texas, he would come back and he would not only talk about the potential he saw in the department there, but he raved about one of these secretaries that he thought was exceedingly competent and so exceedingly nice. And he talked about how great a job he thought the janitors did in keeping the building um, clean. When he would travel getting, giving presentations, he would frequently come back and tell me about this incredible person that he had just met. More often than that, that incredible person was some young undergraduate or graduate student. At Texas, Jack taught a large introductory um, class, the kind that most senior faculty members would prefer not to teach. But Jack loved it because he was passionate about each student and about teaching and mentoring and motivating them. Dixie and I are honored to teach that same class together today. Jack's legacy continues through the generations of exercise science students yet to come. Jack had a lot on his plate. He was always busy, but he always made time to meet with people. And when you met with him, you had his full attention. You were the most important thing in the world to him at that moment. 10 or 15 years after Jack left Texas, one of our secretaries retired. And it was one that Jack had not worked that much with. But as soon as he found out that she'd retired, he sent her a card with a precious letter. That was Jack. Everyone was important to him. Jack was this way because he knew his father in heaven. And he loved us well because of that relationship. Jack always saw the best in people. He didn't try to mold anyone into his image. He encouraged and gave each and every one of us the opportunity to be who we were and to be the best of who we were. I was in Jack's office many times when I had messed up or when somebody else had messed up. He never yelled at you. He never berated you. He always helped you and inspired you to do better the next time. Even when he had differences with people, and even in private, he was always honoring. Jack was always optimistic, upbeat, and energetic. He worked hard. He worked hard hours, but there was always an incredible spark in his life. He led by example. He led by serving. He led by gladly doing whatever needed to be done. And as you all know, Jack was the consummate professional. I remember being in a meeting at Arizona <clears throat> with Mel Zuckerman when he was first starting Canyon Ranch. Jack wasn't at the meeting and we were going round and round and round trying to figure something out. And Mel finally said, let's just have Jack do it. It will be written beautifully, it will be done perfectly, and it will be done on time. That was Jack. One of the things that made Jack so productive and also caused him to lose a fair amount of sleep was that he was a closure person and he was always looking ahead. As soon as he had something to do, he didn't rest until it was done. Um, Ed Coyle, who got his PhD uh, with Jack at Arizona and who helped recruit Jack to Texas, laughs in telling the story about recruiting Jack to Texas. Jack turned him down about three times. And when he finally said yes, Jack, I mean, Eddie is not quite sure if he told which came first, closing on his house or saying yes to Texas. So when Jack went to A&M, Eddie's first question was, have they bought a house yet? And I said, you know, Eddie, there's some questions you don't need to ask, you already know the answer to. 
and it was a trip to travel with Jack. <clears throat> now this story is slightly embellished for the effect, but it would go something um, like this. As soon as we get to the airport to go to a heritage meeting, Jack would pull out his American Airlines um, schedule um, that he had, and he'd say, okay, coming back, we're on the 8 p.m. flight, but if we leave as soon as the meeting's over, we can make the 7 p.m. flight. Interpretation, if we run all the red lights, break the speed limit, there's less than a 50% chance that we'll make it. Then, if we hustle, interpretation, set a world's record for the 400 meter dash, we can make this, con this particular connection and we'll get back two hours earlier. So I've called John Paul, Claude's assistant, and he will be sitting in his car at the, end, at the entrance with the engine running so we can leave as quickly as possible. And if we work really hard and fast, and if Jim Skinner doesn't talk too much, and you know maybe Claude will be really nice to us and he'll let us out early. Then we could make the 6 p.m. flight and we could get home three hours earlier. And lo and behold, we made a lot of those flights. Like all of us, Jack had his lovable quirks. Every so often he'd come in and say, I'm just too busy. I'm gonna clear my calendar and slow down. <laughs> during, during one of these stages, I got him excited to take up golf, which he had played when he was younger. He bought a set of used golf clubs and we got to the golf course once. Jack wasn't wired to slow down. He was too curious. He loved working. He loved getting things done. He loved being productive. And he loved, inspired, and blessed all of us and our profession in the process. I'm most fortunate to have had the opportunity to work side by side with him for so many years. And I'm thankful each and every day of my life for him. I know I speak for many in this room when I say that, and I am confident that Jack was received in heaven with the words, well done, good and faithful servant. Thank you. The next speaker is Larry Kinney, talking about Jack as a basic scientist. As a student and as a young faculty member, I certainly knew of Jack Wilmore. And as I became more and more involved in the leadership of ACSM, I got to know Jack a little bit. But my, my closeness and friendship with him really began when he and Dave Costell invited me to join them as, as a co-author of, of their exceptional textbook. My, my best memories of Jack involve sitting around the kitchen table at Jack and Dottie's house, starting my first efforts at, at writing or helping write a textbook. And we would start in all earnestness working on a chapter, and within 15 minutes I would realize we were talking about family. Jack asked, about all of my children, knew my children's names, knew what sports they were participating in, knew all their academic achievements. He would talk about his family very proudly and very humbly, as Jack always did. Then we'd get back to work a little bit, and within minutes, I would realize we'd be talking about family again. The other thing that we talked a lot about in writing a textbook, which Mike Joyner mentioned earlier, was Jack's uncanny ability to make complex information relatable and understandable to students. And I certainly learned a lot in the process of working with Jack on three editions of the textbook in terms of being able to take complex data and filter it down to a level that a clear message came through. And so in that vein, what I'd like to do today is show you some relatively complex data 
Jim invited me to speak about Jack's scientific contributions, and in particular, basic science. So if you'll bear with me, in the spirit of Jack's ability to show data and drive home a point, I'd like to show you a little bit of data and drive home a point or two. And this is a case where, while numbers often lie, they don't in this case. Many of you will uh, recognize this as uh, uh, the web of science. You can go onto the web of science and enter authors' names and come up with a cross-section of the number of articles, for example, that an individual published in each year, refereed journal articles. And I call your attention to the axis on the left because while you can see increases and decreases and large increases with the Heritage Family Study, it's amazing to me that that access is not seven or eight publications a year, it's 36 to 40 publications a year. But more importantly, we talk a lot in science about how to gauge, numerically gauge, the impact individuals have had on their respective disciplines. And so I show you here the number of times Jack's articles have been cited by his peers in every year from 1964 through 2015. And you can see, again, I draw your attention to the axis, which is not a dozen times or a couple dozen times, but 650 to 700 times a year Jack's work has been cited. So as academics, we go through these uh, numerical machinations of looking at how to quantify the impact people have had on our discipline. Jack's works, according to the Web of Science, have been cited almost 13,000 times. And if you take out self-citations, the number almost stays the same. And isn't that an appropriate reflection on Jack and his career? H-index, for those of you who aren't familiar, is a number that's used a lot now in hiring decisions and promotion decisions. And it really talks about publishing articles that create a major and lasting impact on the scientific community. And you'll see there that Jack's H-index in the, the search that I did is a number 63. I'll come back to that in a second. These are the five most cited publications of which Jack was an author. The number one cited paper is a 1969 paper for which Jack was the sole author. And I think it's mo both ironic because Jack was the ultimate team player, collaborator, confidant that a sole authored publication is the most cited work in Jack's career. It's ironic, but it's also important because Jack made those types of contributions to our knowledge in exercise science. I'll close just by showing you what that H index really means. This is a, a graph, again, complex data, but I'll try to make it simple. On the x-axis is the number of published articles, and that H factor that I mentioned before is on the y-axis. And each of those lines represents a different discipline, molecular biology, immunology, microbiology, chemistry, physics, and so on. And here's where Jack falls on that line. So I'll just close by saying uh, I've treasured my opportunity to get to know Jack, get to know Dottie. Jack is a preeminent scientist, a thoughtful scholar, careful researcher, a renaissance thinker, a caring teacher, an exceptional writer, and I'm proud to say friend. Thank you. Dave Costell. I asked him to talk about Jack as an applied scientist, but Dave never listened to me anyway. He's going to say what he's going to say, so I'm here today. Yeah, you know me too well. <laughs> well, uh, I could uh, begin at the beginning, because I've known Jack uh, this month 
uh, 50 years. Uh, we met, uh, as Jack will explain. At that time when uh, I found out, it was actually when I was at Ithaca College, I found out about ACSM. I went to a regional meeting uh, at, in Amherst at the University of Massachusetts. And uh, I, that's where I met my lifelong friend, Dave Costell. And uh, it was... Uh, he was at Cortland. He was or, at Cortland yeah. State. I was at Ithaca College, and they were just a few miles yeah. apart. We met there and have become lifelong friends. And so, so uh, uh, Jack was very kind in, in including me as a lifelong friend. But the uh, uh, thing he left out was that uh, he and I always laughed about the fact that we actually met standing at the urinal during a coffee break. <laughs> And the other thing that most people probably don't realize is that uh, that was 1965. And uh, in 65, even though we had met each other, uh, we were in competition for the job at Berkeley. Uh, Jack got the job at Berkeley, and I got an old teacher's college in Muncie, Indiana. But uh, we were very close, and we kept in contact, uh, very close contact over the years. And uh, in 1972, uh, Jack con convinced me to uh, bring my family and go to Davis, California, so that he and I could do some research together. And uh, part of that was to go down to Santa Barbara and do some studies on the football team. So our practical experience uh, paralleled. Our careers were very much the same. We both had started out uh, physical education majors with minimal, and I use that word very heavily, minimal background in science. So what we learned was kind of what we uh, learned on the job uh, to become scientists, and uh, this was an opportunity. But Jack uh, was always good uh, as a speaker and uh, was always a favorite, and so fortunately I was tagged along and uh, one of, uh, he and I had sort of a favorite uh, gig, as we like to call it. Uh, every December, he and I were invited to go to Hawaii for one week by the uh, American Medical Joggers Association to put on a clinic. And so for 10 years, we went and spent a week together in a condo, which they provided. Uh, a great opportunity because Jack and I could sit together and commiserate about uh, various problems we had in work and so forth. And it was during the time that we were in uh, Hawaii that we came to the conclusion that we should do a book. And uh, you're all familiar with the textbook. It's been mentioned already. But uh, I have to point out that this was, uh, excuse me, I go backwards. Uh, I should point out that really this was his brainchild and he had to do a lot of talking to convince me to join him. Uh, we, Even though we divided the book, I can tell you exactly that every time I thought I was making great progress in writing my share of the chapters, I would write one chapter, he would write three. So it was killing me. I mean, I was... Uh, I'm a slow reader, and uh, but Jack would not only do all the writing, he uh, was the guy who read every word of every edited version uh, from the editors uh, over and over. All I told Jack was, I'll read my stuff, you read, and he would read all of it. And I don't know how many times that took place, but that... Uh, uh, being on the road with Jack was always an experience. Uh, we roomed together a lot. Uh, I think uh, one little story I'll tell is that uh, I was probably, it was probably Jack's first experience going overseas. Dottie can correct me, but uh, I don't think he'd had much experience with jet lag. So we went to give a talk in Rotterdam uh, and when, uh, of course, Jack was wired, so he was awake the whole trip. And when we got there, uh, it was 10 o'clock in the morning, we went to the meeting, and uh, we're sitting there, and after listening to broken English for about, uh, you know, three hours, I look over at him, and his eyes are glazed. And uh, he turns to me, and he says, uh, you think we could maybe take a short rest? And I said, yeah, let's go. We went back to the motel, or back to the hotel. And uh, what that short nap turned out to be six hours. And we missed 
the symposium banquet uh, and uh, d didn't bother either one of us, but what it did result in, at two o'clock in the morning, this picture was taken uh, because neither one of us could sleep, and so we sorted slides. So uh, at, there are those of you in the audience who've had the same experience. But I, uh, we all know that, and we've heard the superlatives uh, cast about Jack. I can't add to that. He, he was everything that everybody said. Uh, I, uh, he was a superstar, there's no question. Uh, but I think of him more as a brother and as a very, very close friend. And the, that relationship, I'm sure my wife Judy and I will cherish to my end. I thank you very much. Jim, this one's for you. Oh. I'm glad you didn't listen to me. I have the pleasure and the difficult task to try to talk about Jack as a friend. Not because Jack wasn't a friend, but we, there's so many things that we all knew about him. And, and you, you, when I was working on this, I say, how does someone describe a person like Jack? And I, this is what I wrote. Jack Wilmore was one of the kindest, most caring, moral, tolerant, and quietly effective and an intellectual people I have ever known. When he talked, you listened because you, you knew he was going to say something humorous, something he'd been thinking about, or just something that he felt seriously. I always enjoyed being with him and usually learned something. He can make it simple, but not, maybe not all the time for me. But we, as Dave said, we learn things as we grew together. I, I gave a talk a number, about 10 years ago at the University of Illinois, and I was talking about in when I, my first course in exercise physiology, the textbook we used did not mention ATP. And when I said that to the students, they wondered what part of the Stone Age I was from. But I, I, I remember I used to sit with Jack and Dave, and we, we would talk about what was going on and what the, what the new things that we're learning together. And that, to me, was always one of the nicest things about coming to the meetings. As I mentioned, Jack had a sense of humor. And I always found that it was, he, he was even happier when he was the result of the joke. He, he loved that. And when he, had, when he had his heart surgery and got pig, uh, the, the, the valves, they were pig valves, and with the first meeting of the heritage, he said, see, pigs can fly. <laughs> and so he would always tell us these stories. And Jack and Skip are always sending information, cards to each other and kidding with each other. For example, Skip would send something uh, like a, a postcard from Alcatraz and say, Jack, we have a cell block reunion, uh, cell block 462 reunion next week in uh, San Francisco. And so they were always sending things back and forth. And one time I was in Singapore, and so I found something that I won't describe, but I, it was something that was really funny. And I had a friend send it from Thailand, so that Jack wouldn't know who did it. So he came back, and he was sure that Skip had done this. And he called Skip and was telling him about it. And of course, Skip, every time he said, I don't know what you're talking about, Jack was more convinced that, in fact, that he had done it. So a couple of weeks later, he happened to be at my house, and we were talking. And he was telling me this story. And I was trying to keep a straight face. And then finally, he realized that I was the one that sent it. But he, he loved laughing. I think Jack had, had a, a, I think, a soft laugh. But every time he laughed, it was a laugh from his heart. And I always remember that. Fortunately for me, we often agreed during discussions on science and research. That made me feel better, because otherwise I was wondering if I was doing the right thing. We worked very closely together at the early stages of the ACSM certification program in Aspen. We, uh, he was president in 78, 79, and I was president in 79, 90. So we worked very closely with that particular aspect. Jack and Dave convinced me to, to run a marathon. I only ran one in my life, but I did Boston. And of course, they finished about an hour ahead of me. But Jack was right at the, right at the when I stopped, Jack was standing there for me. 
when I was in Canada, he also let me know that there was a job at Arizona State University. That was when he was at Arizona. So I, I came down to Arizona. My wife and I came down and we spent time and he was telling me about the situation and what I should do. So I always thanked him for that job. Then we were together in the Heritage Family Study for a number of years and we would always sit next to each other and just laugh and talk and have a good time and learn and study and it just was a, a pleasure. When, we, when we, did, we got it going, then Christy, his daughter, was trained by Jack and came and worked as a local project coordinator for the Heritage Study with me. And I found out later that there was this very collective sigh of relief among the Heritage Consortium that finally someone's going to make sure that the science was done correctly. So Christy, I thank you very much for that. Jack contributed so much to the world around him, to the profession he loved, and to me personally. The world has lost a special human being. The profession has lost a gifted scholar and teacher. And I have lost a close and special friend. Now, what I'd like to do is, the next one is to have Wendy, his daughter, is going to come up and make a few comments on behalf of the family. Wendy? Oh, we have a duet. And I think we need to get Uncle Art up here at some point, maybe at the end, just to tell a brother story. We have uh, my dad's brother sitting right here and his wife. Art, you want to raise your hand? Yeah. Anyway, well, most of you know by now that um, the have an idea of the kind of man that our dad was. Um, at home, he was pretty much the same. He was very loving, kind, encouraging, optimistic, helpful, an amazing role model for goodness, generosity, and integrity. And as you have just heard, he was a man with a great sense of humor. And um, he would, oh gosh, growing up in Tucson, I remember, we would just be sitting at the dinner table and all of a sudden he would throw his napkin, wad it up like a basketball, and throw it into my mom's glass, like out of the blue. And then that would start a big napkin war. Um, always photobombing family pictures with, uh, you know, peace sign behind. I have a picture of my daughter's soccer game, and he's photobombing it with some funny thing, and um, just always took every situation and tried to make it funnier. Um, he would be silly, completely goofy, and most of the time when we were teenagers, downright embarrassing. Um, his sense of humor was great at diffusing tense situations. We were a family of uh, all females, except for my dad. And so he took uh, tense situations and turned them um, much calmer. This would include stubborn two-year-olds all the way to excessive teenage girls who hor uh, our hormones were going crazy and he would take it all in stride, calming mom, mom and daughters down, managing to bring peace back into the home. Later, as the kids, the grandkids came along, they would call him Papa Jack, and he had all the more reason to be silly and goofy. He gave them horsey rides, horsey bites, played catch and swam in the pool with them. He intended ball games, track meets, swim meets, soccer games, school shows, dance recitals. And uh, when they moved back to Tucson and lived in Saddlebrook, they had a golf cart. And his, one of his greatest joys was to go around in the golf cart, taking the grandkids one by one, sometimes loading them all up, and uh, looking for deer or rabbits or teaching the older kids to drive with the golf cart. Um, we asked each of our children to write one word about Papa Jack, and these were the words. Inspirational, silly, caring, funny, selfless, goofy, and loving. 
Those all came from age 21 to down to five. Another trait that, w that stood out was his availability. He was a very busy man and was flying in and out of town, but even with the busy schedule, he always made time for all of us. He had a home office with an open door where we could always go in for a hug, a chat, um, to play, or just anything. He was always there for us. He was always at our school and sporting events when in town, and he might even leave work early to attend a ball game and then to drive back to the university to finish up a day's work. He even flew home from the ACSM meeting in, um, that was here in San Diego in 1984 to attend Christie's graduation, flew back to Tucson, and then the next morning got up and flew back to ACSM to finish up his responsibilities here. And then there was his faith. It was always there, always grounding him. Almost every morning, he was on his knees praying for all those people that he loved and cared for, both family and friends. He would spend many hours studying, preparing Bible lessons to share at church or home groups, and teaching others about the Lord. He generously supported many missionaries over the years and would buy boxes and boxes of Bibles to send overseas to the poor. And uh, a teacher to the end, leaving all of us a message, he passed away November 15th at 6.33 in the morning. Well, one of the most noted verses in the Bible is Matthew 6.33. Um, Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. And as my dad would sum it up, put God first, and the rest of your life will fall into place. He was a super dad, grandpa, friend, husband, and we are all missing him greatly. We are comforted by all the memories we have and we'll cherish those and the words we're hearing here for the rest of our lives. Thank you. Well, we only had one person say Jack was great, and that was Mike. And now is the chance for the people from the audience to come up. There are a few microphones. And like I said, if you've got something that you think was unique or special about Jack that you want to share with the, the rest of the audience, we would appreciate if you'd come up and say who you are. I, I give you a minute, unless you're really doing well, I'll give you a minute and a half. Okay? But. I see. Is that, is that microphone over there? Is that? Yeah. Well, you come on up here. This. this is Jack's brother. I'm Art, the youngest brother of uh, Dumb, Dumber, and Dumbest. So, uh, <laughs> as some of you may know, Jack had some some goofy things that would go on at times, and we would always give him a bad time about that. So. Already it's been recognized that he had a great sense of humor and uh, that he was very devoted to his family. I can remember when we were living in San Inez and we grew up on a chicken ranch. We had 60,000 chickens on one of the ranches that we were on. and um, He would get the keys from Gordy Gray and go open up the San Inez gym and I would beg him to take me with him and it was just like throwing a kid into a popcorn factory. I, I majored in sports. I didn't have near the academia that he had uh, in his life. But just to be able to be there, jump on the trampoline, shoot hoops, go to one basket to another, and he was just always there encouraging. Um, the second thing was he had a great sense of humor, and he did love to get sense of humor played against him. So when we were living in Atascadero, California, we had a dog named uh, Ralphie. And Ralphie's bladder kind of moved to how excited the dog got during the time that somebody would come. And so we had this all prepared. And uh, so Ralphie is a big dog, and it took everything of me to be able to hold him in my hands as I heard Jack and Dottie kids driving up. And so I had Jim being able to open the door at the right time. And, and Jack would have his normal greeting, hey, you know, how's it going? And I go, and Ralphie, Ralphie, Ralphie. And I had Ralphie r pointed right here where everything could do is damage. And Jack's going, oh, like this, right? <laughs> Jumping back, and he had urine all over him. And I guess it's OK to use urine and bladder. And uh, so the next day, I had taken a nap. And little did I know as I was taking a nap, <laughs> 
that my brother was already uh, developing his game plan to get back at me. And so he had this water that he had a wash rag with. And so he was pouring it on my face as I was kind of waking up and trying to figure it out. And he was going, Ralphie, Ralphie, Ralphie. And he'd pour more of this wash rag down. And, and so that's him. That's my brother. That's my brother. Thank you, Art. We have some, uh, some microphones right here, so just say who you are and what you want to do your, your, your thing. Go ahead. My name is Kent Pandolf, and I'm going to tell you a story about uh, Jack that was in October of 2011. And the event was the uh, 50th anniversary of the U.S. Army Research Institute of Environmental Medicine. And we wanted a commemorative symposium with experts in four areas, the four mission areas of the Institute to speak. And I was in charge of this in terms of organizing it. And the person I asked to speak on uh, human performance physiology and uh, exercise was Jack. And the, the real story is this. I had known Jack for years and years and had a lot of respect for him. But I had never really worked directly with him. Well, when Jack takes on the task, he had a one-hour keynote lecture to give. He spent more time to tailor that talk to the military than you could ever imagine. I saw more slides. He sent me slides and slides and slides. Do you think this is appropriate? Do you think that is appropriate? I marveled. I mean, most people have a canned talk for an hour. They stand up and give it, and it's the same stuff. He gave a talk that was so good for a military aud audience from an exercise standpoint. Um, and after he showed me all these slides, and I said, Jack, do you really think you can do use these many slides in a one hour period? Oh yeah, I can. The, these, I was keeping track of the time. He said, thank you, and I had a watch, and the watch went off. So that's how rehearsed he was. Yeah. I have more admiration for him um, having done that, having known him, and um, I'm just hitting it from a whole different area, not the straight exercise physiology academic area, but from an applied military standpoint. And I'll never forget it as long as I live. Thank and you, I figured Kent. I needed to share it with you. Yes, thank you, Kent. <clears throat> Steve. I'm Steve Blair, and of course all of us love Jack. He was a great fellow, but I do feel it my responsibility to tell you about a terrible mistake Jack made when he was president. He approved my fellowship to ACSM, <laughs> and he handed me the certificate and shook my hand and said, Steve, now you, you need to get busy and do something. So he appointed me to a committee. So all the dumb stuff I've done ever since, and it's Jack's fault. Okay. Blame him, not me. OK. Thank you. Tip. Well, I'm going to follow uh, Costell's lead and ignore everything you instructed us to do up here, Skinner. <laughs> I've that, done that, that, that for that, 20 years. That's not years. a surprise at all. Continue. Yeah. I call him Jackson, not Jack. Jackson. Secondly, I have read two of those papers that you showed, Larry, so therefore, am I eligible to apply for a Wilmore Award? <laughs> no. It says a young investigator two years out of, of past your training, and you, you're much more than that. Well, I'll work on that then. Okay. <laughs> because of those articles, and because I was getting in, involved in the Iowa wrestling study, I needed to know how to measure residual volume. I really didn't know Jack too well, but I knew of him that virtually all of us here. So I called Jack, and he invited me down, and he would show me. But he also invited me to his house with St. Dottie and her kids to spend the night. So all those attributes that you'd heard about Jack, they're true. All those attributes that you'd heard about his family, 
It is true. They welcomed me into their house and they made me feel as a part of their home. So the results that I had from the becoming here, I obviously learned how to do <coughs> residual volume. Data wasn't too good, but it helped me in my IRA reference learning. But I learned that what you have heard about Jack Wilmore today is true. He was a scholar, he was a friend, and he was a devoted family man, and he is truly a devoted Christian man. So believe what you've heard because it is true. Thank you, Tip. <clears throat> Yes. Hi. Uh, my name is Alan Moore, and uh, I'm going to take this a slightly different perspective than the other speakers, but Jack it has a very uh, near and dear place in my heart. Uh, I first met Jack uh, when he came to the University of Houston as a visiting faculty member, and I was a newbie faculty member at that time, and learned just a great deal from him right then and there. Um, my contact with Jack continued through the years. I ended up going to NASA. Jack worked on some NASA projects with us. Uh, or I should say, Jack worked on the projects and we watched him and learned a lot. Um, my story that I'll share about Jack though, uh, that stands out the most is uh, back in 1999, uh, I ended up having my midlife crisis. Now, some of you guys have had a midlife crisis and some of you haven't. Uh, but I will just say that I was questioning everything in my life. I was questioning my faith, I was questioning my marriage, I was questioning what I was doing as a professional. Jack happened to be at Texas A&M University at the time. And uh, I picked up the phone and uh, called Jack, uh, talked a little bit about uh, my problems. And he said, Alan, why don't you just come up to uh, College Station and spend the day with me. And uh, so I hopped in the car, went up to College Station, uh, met Jack first thing in the morning, and we ended up talking all day. Now, he did have some other things going on, so occasionally I sat for 15 minutes and pondered some of the things that he said. <clears throat> but I'll, I'll say this about Jack in closing. He took the time with me at a part in my life where I really needed encouragement in all areas. And he, he inspired me and remained uh, a close friend ever since. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> okay. We have, we have time for, Just real. for, we're running out of time, but make it very short, okay? So we, we was first. Real, real quick, yeah. uh, I met Jack the day after the Indianapolis 500 in 1977. The only person other than him that I can remember the day I met them is my wife, so that's something. Yeah. I'm the research integrity officer at my university. I deal with a lot of bad things with science, a lot of professors treating their students poorly, and I just get real cynical. And then I think about Jack, and he did have the right stuff. Thank you. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Bill? Yeah, Bill Haskell. Um, a lot of you have had a variety of experiences uh, with Jack. I think I'm probably the only one here who double dated uh, with uh, Dottie and Jack uh, prior to their marriage. And it isn't, I think, by chance that one of their daughters' name is the same as my wife. So I have a, <laughs> pardon me, really special um, uh, association with Jack over the years. Um, I do think it's important that we recognize Jack was a great family man, but I attribute a lot of Jack's success to his family. Thanks. Thank you. <clears throat> hey. I, I would like us now to just bow your head for a few moments of silence and to remember Jack Wilmore. Thank you. Rest in peace, my friend. The lives you've touched are better because you were here. 
thank you all for attending this meeting. And all the people who were co-workers, st students and faculties of Jack, please come up here for a photo. Thank you.